Excellent. All right. <clears throat> we've started you. recording. Excellent. Um, well, good evening, family. Um, I'm really excited to be able to do this lesson with all of you. Uh, I know that we're all in the midst of this fast and we're, we're kind of on the home stretch here. Uh, we have, uh, I believe this Sunday is the day that, that the fast ends and, and I just hope and, and pray that it's been transformative for all of you. I know that uh, there's many of us who might be feeling it this week. I don't know why, but for some reason this week, more so than last week or the week before, I've been feeling the fast a lot more. I've been feeling the pressure. My body's been asking for things that it wasn't asking for a week ago. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, I, I, I just want to encourage us. Uh, we're, we're coming through to the end there. And, you know, tonight what I wanted to do, um, I read through a story in the Old Testament that talked about a time where God's people gathered together to, to meet a challenge and how they did so by, by joining together in a fast. And so what I wanted to do was to look through this story with all of you and to draw some parallels, draw some, some points that we can apply to our situation here today. And so where we're going to look, we're going to look over in 2 Chronicles uh, chapter 20. <clears throat> and beginning in verse 1, it reads, After this, the Moabites and Ammonites, with some of the Munites, came to wage war against Jehoshaphat. Some people came and told Jehoshaphat, A vast army is coming against you from Adam, from the other side of the Dead Sea. It is already in Hazazon Tamar, that is, in Gedi. Alarmed, Jehoshaphat resolved to inquire of the Lord, and he proclaimed a fast for all Judah. The people of Judah came together to seek help from the Lord. Indeed, they came from every town in Judah to seek him. And so this story begins with, you know, kind of this all of a sudden, this severe threat has emerged. So, right, Jehoshaphat, the people of Judah, they, it's not like they were preparing uh, to wage war. It wasn't like they were preparing for three different nations to combine their armies and, 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 and invade them. It's just all of a sudden they find out these three different armies are on their way to invade their land. And it's essentially an existential threat. That is to say, it, it threatens their very existence. You know, Jehoshaphat, the kingdom of Judah, if they were unsuccessful in defending their land, their territory, then they would have been wiped out. They would have been killed. They would have been enslaved. The, Jerusalem would have been put to the sword, taken over by these people. And so they're facing this, this very real threat uh, that is that is suddenly emerged out of nowhere. And what the passage tells us is that, while well, Jehoshaphat resolved to inquire of the Lord, and he proclaimed a fast, and the people came together. You know, I was thinking about some of the things we've been talking about over the last couple of weeks in the, in the lessons and in the sermons. And uh, one of the things that Leike had mentioned, he, he brought up the uh, fact that he looked at the Pew Research uh, study that said that uh, the, the percentage of people who are religiously unaffiliated, that is that they don't follow any traditional religion who call themselves the nuns, they, they check off the nun box under religion, that number has been increasing over the years. And that number has been particularly increasing out of the younger generations. It's really between the millennials and Gen Z that you see this religious nuns group uh, really grow dramatically. And when you, you hear from, from people in, in this area, what, what you often hear is, is actually that it's not that they're atheist. It's not that they're agnostic even. It's quite literally, or, or, or quite specifically, they, they would consider themselves spiritual people and interested in spiritual things. But when they look out into the larger world of religion, they don't see anything that speaks to them. They don't see anything that relates to them. And as a result, they, they, they short, sort of shut the door on, on any traditional faith. And so a lot of the younger generations are looking at the world of Christendom, and they're not seeing 
the promises of, of, of Christ being lived out in its followers. They look out into the larger world of Christendom and they see them talking about a Jesus of love, but oftentimes can see hate. Or they, they see us talking about compassion, uh, but then also seeing us degrade the poor. And I'm talking about lar the larger Christendom. I'm not talking about, uh, you know, I mean, maybe some of us have fallen into, into these sins as well, but uh, I'm talking as a bigger picture. And so on the one hand, we have this threat that is a growing secular crowd a growing secular youth. And on the flip side, we have this other threat, which is a larger world of Christendom who wants faith without sacrifice. There's so many times that I sit down with people who, who claim to be Christians, who call themselves Christians, but they have not actually sacrificed their lives to Christ. They are entirely fleshly. And I don't mean that they struggle and they fall and, and fall short because we all do that but rather that quite specifically in their beliefs they have not submitted to battle sin they're living openly in sin their lives are behind this sin and so what ends up happening is that there's a christianity that's out there that's oftentimes the christianity that gets used in in you know popular media to portray a religion that is largely hypocritical. So we have a, a young crowd that is, is moving away from religion. We have a religious crowd that is, is portraying religion as hypocritical. And then on top of that, we have our own hearts to contend with. What I mean by that is, you know, last week, like he met, mentioned, you know, where is our hearts in terms of saving the lost? Have we lost our, our desire to save the lost? Do we still grieve for those who are lost? Do we wish and desire to see Miami saved? And I think in a lot of ways, this is like the three-headed army that was beseeching Je Jehoshaphat, the Moabites, Ammonites, and Munites. We have the secular trend moving away from faith. We have a religious trend that portrays anyone who carries the name of Christ as hypocritical. And then we have our own hearts that wrestle with whether or not we even want to engage. And that right there is the threat that we face today. That could right there very well be an existential threat. Why? Because if our, young, if our youth are moving away from religion and we fail to capture that crowd, what will the One Miami Church look like? 20 years down the road? What will we look like 30, 40 years down the road? Will the One Miami Church continue to exist, operating and honoring God and being a light in the city of Miami? That's the danger if we do not set ourselves to face this threat that is coming before us. But we also have to acknowledge that these threats are bigger than us. How do you change the secular trends? How do you change the religious world? How do you change? Well, our own hearts, we can certainly battle against, but sometimes that can be difficult too. How do we change our own hearts when we don't desire something? How do we change our hearts to desire? And I think right here, we have it spoken in this passage. First, we gotta be alarmed, just as Jehoshaphat was in verse three. We gotta be alarmed but then we have to resolve to inquire of the Lord. We must resolve ourselves to seek God. We must resolve ourselves to call on God to intervene. And so that's what they do in this story. Jehoshaphat, he proclaims a fast. And what's cool is that he proclaims a fast over the land, but then everybody shows up in Jerusalem. All the people of Judah come in from every town. They show up at the temple and, and, and they go to Jerusalem to fast together. So they join up in community. And in the midst of this, of this gathering, Jehoshaphat, he stands up and he starts, he starts praying to God. And in his prayer, he starts outlining all the things that God did for the people of Israel. He starts outlining all the miracles that he had done. He tells him, he's like, God, you're a powerful God. You are the one who drove out the inhabitants before us. 
You are the ones who, who, who gave us this land. And here are these three armies, these three nations who have ro- risen up against us. And then I love this here. We're going to pick it up in, in verse 12. This is how Jehoshaphat closes his prayer. He says, our God, will you not judge them? For we have no power to face this vast army that is attacking us. We do not know what to do. But our eyes are on you. We do not know what to do. But our eyes are on you. All the men of Judah with their wives and children and little ones stood there before the Lord. And I love this statement here. Jehoshaphat, in humility, he's acknowledging, I don't have the answers. I'm showing up before God and I'm saying, look, God, you are powerful. You are the one who can do these things. And of course, while he's praying to God, he's not reminding God about what God did, right? As if God needs to be reminded. God's not like, oh, yeah, I did give them this land. What he's really doing is he's reminding himself within his prayer. And he's reminding the people of Israel all the things that God has done throughout this prayer. And so when he gets to the end, he just says, look, this is the God we are putting our trust in. We are putting our trust in the God who drove out the inhabitants, who gave us this land, the God who is mighty and powerful to save. We don't know what to do. Let's just accept that. We don't know what to do, but our eyes are on God. And I, I love verse 13 because it just, it just shows, it, it, it paints the picture for us. All the men, their wives, the children, the little ones, it's pointing out the little toddlers, the babies running around. They're all there together. They're fasting together. And they're just standing before God waiting for an answer. And what's so great about this is after this prayer, what scripture tells us is that God's spirit comes on one of the people who was present. This man's name was Jehaziel. God's spirit comes on Jehaziel. And he stands up in the assembly. And this is his response over in verse 15. It says, Listen, King Jehoshaphat, and all who live in Judah and Jerusalem. This is what the Lord says to you. Do not be afraid or discouraged because of this vast army, for the battle is not yours, but God's. Tomorrow, march down against them. They will be climbing up by the pass of Ziz, and you will find them at the end of the gorge in the desert of Jerel. You will not have to fight this battle. Take up your positions, stand firm, and see the deliverance the Lord will give you, Judah and Jerusalem. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. Go out to face them tomorrow, and the Lord will be with you. So here in, in, is the answer. The prophet, um, well, what's funny is this. This guy's not spoken of as a prophet. It's almost like God just picked somebody out of the crowd. He chose this man, Jehaziel. And right then and there, this man became the prophet when God's spirit came on him. And so he stands up and he's telling them, look, this is what God says. Don't be afraid. Don't be discouraged. The battle's not yours. It's God. God's going to fight for you. You're not going to have to fight. And right, that's, that's an encouraging message when you're sitting there in, 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 in the, you know, before God in the temple. And you have these three armies that are are coming against you and you know you can't win to hear the word that, well, hey, the the people of uh, or rather that God is going to fight on your behalf. And so. So that's the message they get and they're they're, they're fired up, they're encouraged. But there's something interesting here because God wants them to participate in this victory. He tells them they're not going to fight in it but he still wants them to participate in the victory. God could have just said, hey, look, I'm I'm gonna take care of this army. I'm gonna take care of that force. You don't even have to leave Jerusalem. But instead he says, you know what? I need you to go take up your position. I need you to go march out there as if you're going to fight. 
I need you to go take your positions and stand firm. And then you'll see the deliverance that God is going to give you. Go out and face them. Go out and face the threat. I know that you can't take on these three armies, but you're going to stand out there. You're going to go out there. You're going to face them. You're going to take your position. And you must stand firm. And then you'll see the rest. And so what happens? Well, beginning in verse 20, it tells us early in the morning, they left for the desert of Tekoa. As they set out, Jehoshaphat stood and said, listen to me, Judah and people of Jerusalem. Have faith in the Lord your God, and you will be upheld. Have faith in his prophets, and you will be successful. After consulting the people, Jehoshaphat appointed men to sing to the Lord and to praise him for the splendor of his holiness. As they went out at the head of the army, saying, give thanks to the Lord, for his love endures forever. So this is this is a cool scene, right? The next morning, so they just they had this amazing prayer. This prophet speaks up. They're all fired up. The very next morning, they gather together, and Jehoshaphat speaks up to them. And and you can kind of imagine, right? After after you kind of disperse from the prayer time, you go home or you go to where you're staying. You go to sleep. Overnight, perhaps some thoughts begin settling in. Perhaps it's like, you know, what if God really didn't speak through that prophet? What if, what if that's a false prophet? What if that guy was speaking on his own? What happens if we go out there tomorrow and God doesn't show up for us? How are we going to stand before these three armies? And those sort of doubts can kind of creep in, into our hearts, can they not? And so right when they gather together, Jehoshaphat stands up and, and he just affirms for them. He says, listen to me, people of Judah and Jerusalem, have faith in God. Put your faith in God. You will be upheld. And put your faith in his prophets. You will be successful. And then after he consults with the people, Jehoshaphat appoints song leaders. They get the worship leaders out in front of the army and they start praising God. They start singing songs of praise. So they march out into battle, singing songs of praise. Give thanks to the Lord for his love endures forever. That's how this army goes out to face these three armies that have taken up their, their stand against them. So they march out. And here we have it in verse 22. It says, as they began to sing and praise, the Lord set ambushes against the men of Ammon and Moab in Mount Seir, who were invading Judah, and they were defeated. The Ammonites and Moabites rose up against the men from Mount Seir to destroy and annihilate them. After they finished slaughtering the men from Seir, they helped to destroy one another. When the men of Judah came to the place that overlooks the desert and looked toward the vast army, they saw only dead bodies lying on the ground. No one had escaped. So Jehoshaphat and his men went to carry off their plunder, and they found among them a great amount of equipment and clothing and also articles of value, more than they could take away. There was so much plunder that it took three days to collect. On the fourth day, they assembled in the Valley of Baraka, where they praised the Lord. This is why it is called the Valley of Baraka to this day. So what happens? Well, they start singing their songs of praise and marching out. They're following God in obedience. And it says that when at, at whatever point they started singing and praising, well, those three armies started attacking each other. They started attacking each other until they just wiped each other out. And by the time the army arrived at the place that overlooks the desert, they just saw the entire army wiped out before them. All three armies, all three nations completely destroyed. They didn't have to fight. They didn't have to, to sling a, a single arrow. They didn't have to pull out a single sword. They just arrived and the victory was already had for them. And it was so complete of a victory that they go out and, and they're like, well, you know, let's take the plunder. And they're at it for three days, gathering everything that, 
that got left out there. And on the fourth day, they just go and worship God together for the victory. And when we, we take a stand back and consider how all of this came together, when we consider what all of this was about, it was that the people of God gathered together. They, 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 they decided to seek God. They had a fast. And there, from that point, from their togetherness, from seeking God together, from coming into community, by elevating God and looking for his voice in this matter, well, they had the voice of God speak to them. And through obedience to his voice, they had victory secured. This all came, this all started in a position where they were facing their annihilation. And it turned into a, a day of praise in the valley where they had complete victory assured. And you have to understand that when we look at this story, what makes this all possible was that they came together in the first place. There is so much power in the unity of the body. There is so much power in that togetherness. Together we can resolve to seek God. Together, we can join together and we can hear God's voice speaking to us. We can seek out the prophets in our community. We can seek out God in prayer. Together, we find courage. We find faith. We find camaraderie in the word of God and in one another. Together, we find like-minded people who are seeking God and strengthening each other to do the same. Together, we can praise and worship God for all the mighty deeds that he has done. Together, we can face down the threats. Together, we are stronger, and together, we stand. And you know, when I, when I thought about this very point, when I saw how important that togetherness, the man, the women, the children, the little ones coming together before God, that community coming together before God, it struck me that in my own life, I can be challenged in truly pursuing one another relationships. And John talked about it this, this last Sunday, about the relationships, the importance of our relationships in the fellowship. And, and, and I wanna give a, a specific encouragement to my, my married brothers and, si and sisters. And, and I, have a, I have an encouragement for, for you know, campus teens and singles as well. But right now I wanna speak to my married brothers and sisters. It's something that I've realized being married, especially with kids in the picture. It's that building organic friendships can be a real challenge. It can be a real challenge to really build deep friendships with one another. Because the thing that, that is required for deep friendships is time. And it's so easy for us when we're married to look at the, you know, first, first Corinthians 7 talks about it. Our, our ministry is our family. Uh, we, our, our, our devotions are divided, so to speak, as it says in the passage. And we have this responsibility to look after our families. But what can happen, I think, is that our family becomes everything. And then we lose out on the fellowship outside. It can be so easy to come to church, come to Bible talk, and never see or talk to another brother or sister outside of those times. It can be so easy to, to forget just that we need these friendships and seek them out. It can be hard or difficult to, to get that cup of coffee with a brother or sister. It can be hard to think of others and pick up the phone and just see how someone's doing. And I know there's people who are strong in this and weak in this, but I hear it more consistently, not just here, but in all over from married brothers and sisters, I hear the same story. Uh, you know, I reach out to people I never hear back. I call people, I engage, but I, I don't get calls back. No one's checking on me. Or I try to engage with people to spend time together and, and it's, they just never, people don't wanna spend time. I don't know what it is. And what I wonder is if we've made our families, if we've made our commitment, which is a real commitment that we have to uphold, but if we've not elevated that into a place 
that is beyond where it needs to stand. And in so doing, we've sacrificed the one another aspect of the ministry of Christ. You know, there's a real, there's a real aspect of this that we have to consider. The world will look to our relationships and they'll see Christ. John 13, 34, a new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. And this right here is the opportunity. You know, if people look at our lives and do not see the love we have within the fellowship, do not see the love we have for one another, do not see that, hey, we are, are reaching out to each other, that we're spending time with each other, that we truly love for each other, that we'll stand up and, and fight for each other, that we'll die for each other, to love each other the way that Christ loved us. If the world does not see that, then they will have a hard time seeing disciples of Christ. Christ says it himself. People will know that we're, we're his disciples through the love that we show. If we show that love to the world, then I believe what will happen is that, well, that secular trend of people moving away from religion, they will be drawn back. They will look at the relationships. They will look at the love and see exactly what has been lacking. I think that people in the religious crowd will desire a fellowship that is built on truth. The people will, will desire a fellowship that is truly fighting for righteousness. And they'll see that in our relationships. You see, our relationships with one another isn't just about our own selves. I think that's how we can think of it is that, man, okay, like, all right, I'll get time with people if I need it. It's not about you. It's about us. And it's about Christ and how we are going to show Christ to this world. We need to love one another. It's a new command. Jesus does not say a new suggestion I give you. He says a new command I give you, you must love one another. And this is where we need to bend our practices. If we are those who have perhaps distanced ourselves uh, from relationships, to start diving back in, to start picking up that phone and calling a brother or a sister to start getting that cup of coffee, to start staying after a service so that you can hang out with somebody. Coordinate it, obviously, but, but, but this is where we need to start engaging and building that community. And you know, I, I emphasize the marriage because I think this is an area the marriage can struggle with, but for my campus teen single brothers and sisters, I tell you right now, seek these relationships out. Seek those relationships out in this stage of your life because those relationships, if, if you, you dig into them, you use the time that you have to get those shared experiences together, to build that depth, to build that intimacy with one another, those are friendships that can last a lifetime. I still have people to this day who text me who I knew from my campus days. I still have people that I talk to from my teen ministry days. I have people who check up on me from my singles ministry days because those are relationships that will la can last for a lifetime. Invest in them. Invest your energy. Invest your heart. And there's always risk in investing our hearts. But the risk is worth it because it allows us to live out the command that Jesus has given us. You know, we can't allow the busyness of life to have us disobey. God's word. I'm somebody who can go a very long time. I confess, I can go a long time without really engaging with other people. And I'm realizing after reading this, after reading this story and seeing how important community is, I realized that, well, two, two major things. One, that I need to repent. And two, I really do not understand just how much I need you. I have not understood just how much I need you, my family. And I hope that this lesson, that, that, that this scripture, what we are talking about today, I hope that this sparks within each and every single one of us 
the desire to love deeply and to start engaging in relationships. And why? Why would we do that? Well, when we come together, well, then, when, then we can pray for each other in ways that perhaps we couldn't do alone. And when we pray powerfully together, we may see that the prophets amongst us start to speak God's word. And when we hear God's word, we are called to obedience. And when we obey it, victory is secure. As we start to bring this lesson to a close, I wanted to ask us, what is this fast going to be for us? What will this 21-day fast be for you? Will this be 21 days and then everything goes back to normal? No transformation, no change? Or will this be the time that you truly commune with God and that you are transformed by it? Will 21 days of sacrifice go by and we will and having us see a new and enlivened and renewed ministry of God? Whatever we do, family, we have to remember that we're stronger together. We're stronger united. God will move powerfully through our faith, our humility, and our actions. We can spur one another on. Let us join together to spur one another on. Because when we do that, well, we're going to bear witness to the miracles of God and ultimately his victories. My family, together, we can stand. I thank you so much for, for your time. And, and with that, my family, I just want to leave you with a couple questions to consider. And these two questions are this. What step can you take this week to begin building greater depth in your friendships, in the fellowship? And once this fast is over, how will you engage in helping to spread the gospel here in Miami? And I close out with this. The threat we face is, is such that, that there is a world that needs to know Christ and a world that is moving away from it. And I believe with faith that together, we can make sure that that does not happen here in Miami. Thank you, my family. Amen. Uh, hold on, let me, hold up, babe. Thank you, Fernando. Appreciate the lesson, my brother. And uh, great word, great scriptures, great points, great text. Uh, we have a lot that we could take away from uh, your presentation. And uh, I want us to, uh, those of us, uh, who are able to hang around for the breakout room. Uh, we're going to go into the breakout room for the discussion questions. I hope you, you were able to take a picture of them. But let's have a, a great engaging discussion. And, uh, and then we could close out in prayer after about 10 minutes in our breakout rooms. Before we go into the breakout rooms, however, I would like to make this announcement uh, concerning this Sunday. Uh, after the fasting comes feasting, and this Sunday we're going to have a break fast worship service. Uh, it'll be music, worship, uh, sharing prayer, etc. And we'll also have our, our final message uh, on renew for the month. Originally, we had planned to meet outdoors, uh, but with the COVID, uh, we had to call an audible. And, and so uh, the question is, will we have in-person? Yes, there will be uh, the in-person meeting at 9.30 uh, for those who would like to come. Uh, but this is going to be a break fast Zoom Sunday. All right, the, the worship is going to be entirely on Zoom. And uh, if you would like to meet in your community groups uh, uh, to, to log on to the same Zoom link, you may do so, uh, you could set that up, but we wanna bring food so that after communion, we can enjoy um, a meal together via Zoom. And so 
Uh, just to be clear, we'll all be on the same Zoom channel as a church. And um, But if you meet in your community groups, we're asking you too to be on the same channel, not have a different uh, 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 Zoom link. All right. And so uh, feel free to set up if you want to just stay at home and uh, cook your, your, your whatever breakfast you would like, uh, then you uh, are welcome to do so. But we want to do it as a church uh, together uh, this Sunday at 930. We'll have worship via Zoom and we'll break our fast together following the communion. All right. And so uh, thank you very much. And uh, we'll now go into our breakout rooms. Enjoy your time together. Amen. Thank you, Fernando. <laughs> Thank you, Fernando.